Part of the clean energy transition is coming up with more efficient, more capable, and more productive technologies so that we can accelerate the phase out of, of fossil fuel generation uh, of electricity. Digital twins are basically our version of what's known as, more popularly known as the metaverse or a virtual world. And NVIDIA calls that product Omniverse. What's special about Omniverse is that it actually obeys all of the laws of physics. So you can recreate the entire world. And in fact, we have a platform that, that does that today called Earth 2. But you can create the entire world, you can place objects in it, and they will obey all of the laws of physics. So we can very realistically simulate what's actually going to take place in the real world. You know, two objects colliding with each other, you'll actually get a collision and the rebound effect. So we can, we can show all of those interactions. It's quite impressive, actually. So in, in terms of downstream industries, uh, manufacturing is a huge energy consumer. We've actually got a recent example where Wistron, which is a computer manufacturer lo located in Taiwan, they actually used Omniverse, recreated a digital twin of one of their factories, and saw that they could improve the layout and the construction of the assembly line, including how thermals and heat flows and cooling are conducted inside that building. And immediately they saw 10% energy savings. That's about, a, in their case, that's 120,000 kilowatt hours of electricity. It's taking out about, saving us about 60,000 kilograms of carbon dioxide emissions. So fantastic. I mean, I have so many questions. I just, uh, I'm thinking about how can using the Omniverse and Earth 2 in terms of simulating uh, climate events, how can that inform the energy industry's uh, decision making when it comes to mitigating and adapting to climate risk? So one of the beauty beauties of Earth 2 is it can actually give a very high resolution recreation of the entire planet. Uh, current weather forecasting techniques, they, they typically can give us about a 10 day lead time uh, in look into the future but they cannot really judge extreme weather events. And that's just the nature of what we call numerical weather forecasting. When we start to use AI, we can actually simulate and forecast what are the, light, the, the possibilities of certain weather extreme events that might take place. An example of this might be a heat wave. Uh, uh, another example might be if, if say a typhoon or a hurricane uh, hits in a particular area you can actually much more accurately predict where it might make landfall and evacuate just that precise location of users or even uh, anticipate that hurricanes might take place in, in that particular area and start to harden resources and buildings and infrastructure in that area. So that in the long term will actually save us energy because we're only investing the uh, dollars into protecting assets and lives that are in areas that are the most critical and the most vulnerable. Um, the, the big advantage is obviously the more realistic early warning sy systems that can be put in place. We can much more realistically tell exactly which beach is the one that's going to get hit first. And that's the one where we want to evacuate people uh, most urgently. But when we start to look at it in a longer term basis, if you know that a particular uh, city or location or town is the most likely to get hit, then that's where you can start to harden the roads, the infrastructure, and so on. So it's more resilient in the face of an extreme weather event. Now, in addition to those types of ben downstream benefits, just the very act of simulating the planet within the accelerated computing environment, that also saves a lot of energy. Um, when we run these simulations in our, on our GPUs versus traditional computing, which is people more commonly know as CPUs, central processing units, we, we ex improve energy efficiency by about 2,000 fold. So far faster simulations, far more energy efficient, orders of magnitude of energy savings. And that's what we're really excited about. You know, the power system is balanced every four seconds. Every four seconds on the second, um, it needs to, supply and demand are being dispatched. I mean, it, it literally needs to be balanced much, much, uh, much faster in every four seconds. But that's how instructions to power plants descend is every four seconds. So um, if you imagine just 
thousands of power plants throughout the nation, um, millions and millions of homes and businesses. That's just an enormous challenge. I mean, there there isn't a human on earth that can have a real time understanding of that type of complexity. My I had professors at school used to say, you know, the power system is undoubtedly the most complex machine that humans have ever built. And and I, I think that's still true and it's becoming more complex. So I think that AI, um, you know, one of the things that AI is great at is uh, helping humans sort through complex data, finding trends, helping raise up those those trends, those alarms that, that humans need to think about uh, in more serious ways. So I think that the use of AI for the grid is just, is just enormous and I expect it to grow from here. And I think it is a real opportunity, as you say, for that efficiency. Um, and I'm just wondering if you could explain a bit more about how AI is improving demand management within the grid and what kind of data are the most critical to these models and, and, and you know, how is it being gathered and utilized? We're primarily using AI right now for what we call forecasting. So just predicting what's going to happen on the power system. And there's a lot of things that we have to predict. So we have to predict uh, how much energy, uh, how much load or demand will be on the grid, um, both at the entire national level, but also at a very granular level, like down at the neighborhood level. Um, so we we train and, and deploy AI models to predict that. Uh, we also use AI to predict the amount of solar or wind being generated. Uh, again, similar idea. Uh, we don't know exactly how much will be available in the next minute, hour, or day, but we can use AI to help reduce some of that uncertainty. Um, we also use AI to predict power prices because prices are quite important for the system. Most of most of the world has uh, competitive, what are called competitive power markets, where um, there's a market where energy is bought and sold. And so, being able to predict prices allows us to better understand, you know, how can we trade in those markets better? How can we make sure that we're bringing into the market the resources that that make sense uh, for that given time? I think one of one of the things that is is always really neat to me about what we're doing is. Um, We'll make predictions uh, at the day ahead. So we'll make a prediction of what's going to happen 24 hours from now. And actually, in fact, that prediction will go out full seven days in advance. Um, but then our models are continuously running in the background. They're continuously pulling in new data, uh, hundreds of variables that we are collecting from the internet or from other data brokers or uh, from the power system and, and constantly providing new and updated forecasts. And that evolution of what you predict will happen um, is is arguably as important as the prediction itself. So uh, there's been several, um, you know, extreme weather events here in the United States this summer. And with our AI technology, we were able to look out several days in advance, imagine how it was going to pack the power system. But then as we got closer, had better and better knowledge about how we could help prepare and help our customers manage those risks. Certainly the last few years have shown that AI has the potential to be a significant contributed to carbon emissions and that as someone that cares about that as i know you do um that that is concerning i i do have some just personal optimism that i think that um i think that if you look at when any technology comes out it's it, it is inefficient at first and i i do have confidence that we will find ways to make a more energy efficient i think i think if you look right now it doesn't necessarily make sense for a lot of these it companies tech companies to make their models efficient. I think it's it's about who can get to market the fastest. But I think as we sort of settle into a more, you know, the second phase, a more mature phase of the technology, I, I do think you'll find it will start to make more business sense. That will be that competitive differentiator where um, to make to make their models more energy efficient. So I do have optimism there. But, um, but yeah, I, I think that, you know, going back to the Eros project, we want to use AI to help manage the batteries on, on the New Mexico power system. New Mexico has uh, actually a, a statutory goal of reaching 100% decarbonization by 2040. So our project is is part of that. We're helping them reach that goal. And they anticipate that they will have to install just massive amounts of solar, wind, other clean energy sources on the grid. And without AI, they won't be able to manage that type of complexity. So, you know, it's it, I mentioned the uncertainty of, of solar and wind generation, but also Think about going from a power system where you might have had 10 very large coal generators to 10,000 pretty small rooftop solar generators. So that's just an enormous growth in the complexity. And that's where, again, where we think our project can help them. Um, so we want to make it very replicable. We're demonstrating on, on sort of uh, one to two uh, sites right now. And then we hope that once we demonstrate that, hey, this does work, this technology can scale up, then we want to deploy it in the rest of their of their territory.